Tiananmen Square flooded with armed police, security doubles at Zongnan High. Turbulence persists on eve of two sessions, can the CCP's efforts to maintain power succeed? Government turns mafia, Chengdu police publicly detain Dutch journalist. Wailing wall spooks CCP. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Tiananmen Square flooded with armed police, security doubles at Zongnan High. The news opens with the continuing escalation of tension in Beijing as the two sessions approach. According to a report from Hong Kong's Ming Pao on March 3, Beijing's atmosphere is significantly more tense than in years past, with an evident uptick in armed police patrols around Tiananmen Square and a visual estimate indicating that the number of plainclothes officers outside Zongnanhai's Xinhua Gate has more than doubled. The familiar sight of community volunteers on Chang'an Street has given way to uniformed police officers, and new ID checkpoints at crucial intersections now regulate pedestrian movement, affecting even cyclists near Tiananmen Square. From Jiangwo Road onwards, Chaoyang Mass's volunteer stations appear every 500 meters, manned by groups of seniors in their 60s, donned in red, engaging in casual conversations or standing under red umbrellas. Police cars are stationed at each intersection along Chang'an Street, with patrols around select restaurants and important buildings. Officers are seen taking a long time to question pedestrians who linger. Meanwhile, over 3,000 journalists, with the group comprising more than 2,000 journalists from within China and over 1,000 from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and foreign nations, must possess official conference credentials. In a throwback to procedures adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic, credential collection is predicated on undergoing nucleic acid testing, with credentials only issued once a match between the individual, their credential, and their test result is confirmed. Hong Kong outlets have noted that this is the first time since the Belt and Road Summit that journalists are undergoing nucleic acid testing again, leading to some disarray in a revival of the unpleasant gag reflex from throat swab tests. According to Tsingtao Daily, inside the hotel, everyone wore masks, and the testing staff wore additional protective gear, including face shields, rubber gloves, blue protective caps, and gowns. The exact number of required nucleic acid tests for journalists remains unspecified. As previously reported, last week, CCP officials highlighted that Beijing is witnessing a simultaneous spread of influenza and the new coronavirus. Beijing locals have expressed that the situation with the epidemic has deteriorated, not improved, with a noticeable increase in sudden or unexplained deaths. In the face of the ongoing health crisis, the CCP appears to be at a loss for solutions. Turbulence persists on eve of two sessions, can the CCP's efforts to maintain power succeed? Currently, Beijing is under a cloud of unease and political instability as the two sessions near. A U.S. think tank has highlighted potential issues at this year's meetings, including the speeches and behaviors of various provincial and departmental representatives. While not necessarily reflecting public opinion, their actions may reveal the CCP government's internal conditions amidst economic downturn and escalating debt. Some may show dissent, hinting at internal strife, and anonymous voting could lead to increased opposition or abstentions. Recently, officials from various regions, including a deputy provincial-level official from Shaanxi, as well as officials from the political and legal systems in Quanzhou, Fujian, Guizhou, and Guangzhou, have been investigated. Additionally, political and legal systems in Chongqing and Liaoning have seen reshuffles, suggesting a focus on political stability. Figures such as Chuanzhou's Political and Legal Committee Secretary and Guangdong's Standing Committee member and Political and Legal Committee Secretary have been taken down. Political commentator Li Yanming pointed out that, on the eve of the two sessions, a reshuffle in the provincial public security systems is underway, with many positions being filled by parachuted or externally transferred officials without a background in the political and legal system but are close to Xi Jinping. Aiming for political stability and further cleansing within the public security systems at the provincial level. Analysts believe this move stems from Xi Jinping's need to consolidate power amidst widespread economic depression and increasing instability throughout China. 
The Shi government fears potential threats to its rule both within and outside the party, prompting continuous internal campaigns to purge untrustworthy officials. Highlighting the extent of state surveillance, a Japanese TV crew's visit to Wang Quanzhang, a lawyer targeted in the 709 crackdown, on the eve of the two sessions, revealed intense monitoring by at least four CCP police officers at his residence. It was discovered that Wang's child no longer wanted to attend school due to being followed by authorities, even experiencing intrusion into his classroom. This incident has elicited sighs from netizens, who commented that this explains why China's stability maintenance budget surpasses its defense spending. Contrary to the belief that the government doesn't spend money on the populace, it's all spent on maintaining stability. Netizens emphasize that such measures represent severe oppression and surveillance by the state, with Wang Chuanzhong's ordeal exemplifying the dire consequences for those who challenge the regime's narrative, illustrating a life devoid of human rights, opposing Xi Jinping's thoughts means being erased. The 709 crackdown is a significant campaign launched by the Chinese government on July 9, 2015, aimed at arresting, detaining, and legally prosecuting human rights lawyers, legal assistants, and activists throughout China. The detainees faced accusations ranging from subverting state power to creating a disturbance, marking the government's attempt to suppress dissent and regulate civil society. Wang Quanzhang, one of the targeted lawyers, was arrested in August 2015, later sentenced to 4.5 years for subverting state power, and was released on April 4, 2020. While suppressing democratic activists, the CCP government continues to accelerate debt issuance to artificially stimulate the economy. Public data revealed that in February alone, local governments issued over 400.5 billion yuan, approximately 56.35 billion US dollars, in new bonds, with Zhejiang, Hebei, and Hunan provinces leading in issuance. Sources within the party disclosed to France's L'Express that due to the government's overwhelming debt and the economic crisis spreading beyond Beijing, affecting salaries of one-fifth of the national civil servants, the situation is severe in Zhejiang, especially in Wenzhou, and even worse in Sichuan. Public hospitals struggle to operate, with doctors receiving extremely low monthly incomes, bringing the CCP's fiscal management back to the conditions of the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. Some senior finance officials have suggested that declaring national bankruptcy is necessary. Xi Jinping's overwhelming fear, China's pressure cooker could explode at any time. On March 2, Ms. Guijun, editor-in-chief of the Epic Times's Chinese edition, shared on Elite Forum that a piece by Pierre-Antoine Donat, former AFP Central Editorial Department head, strikingly captures China's precarious state, likening it to a pressure cooker poised to explode at any moment. Ms. Gu pointed out that China currently grapples with profound political and economic crises. However, the primary concern isn't the crises themselves, after all, every nation experiences cycles of growth and decline, and no ascent lasts forever. The critical issue lies in preventing societal collapse during these downturns. Borrowing a metaphor from Chinese entrepreneurs, when the wind blows, even pigs can fly, suggesting that when the wind ceases, pigs will definitely crash while eagles continue to soar. The dilemma now is whether China, having soared on strong winds for the past 40 years, will crash or continue to fly as the wind dies down. This depends on whether one opts to be a pig or an eagle. The Communist Party's predicament stems from its system's foundation on political power, prioritizing individual and party interests over those of the nation, its people, and ethnicity. Many CCP policies appear illogical or defy common sense, yet from the party's perspective, they are deemed necessary and inevitable, leading to a raft of absurd policies and measures. Take economic policy, for instance, it's widely acknowledged that businesses and entrepreneurs are key. A Shanghai publication highlighted the critical need for devolving power and loosening control. Is the CCP unaware of this? Of course, they are aware, but they also recognize that relinquishing control could jeopardize the party's political standing, which explains their reluctance to delegate further power. Ms. Gwit explained that societal power comprises violence, wealth, and knowledge. In more primitive societies, the emphasis on violence is greater. 
With the CCP's reforms, there should have been a shift towards wealth and knowledge, aiming for a new balance of power. To ensure the country's and society's ongoing, healthy development, the reliance on violence should naturally diminish. However, recent years have seen the CCP consolidate its power at the expense of individual wealth and the suppression of new knowledge, leading to the eradication of capitalists and a sweeping purge of speech and thought. This represents a choice befitting pigs, not eagles. From another perspective, because people are not pigs, resistance under such oppression is inevitable, escalating social conflict and tension. The CCP's response has been to ramp up suppression, only leading to an inevitable explosion of social unrest. She believes that Xi Jinping is deeply driven by fear, a fear that intensifies as his policies increasingly fail and unravel. Beijing's recent initiative requiring high-ranking officials to report directly to Xi, emphasizing political loyalty, reflects this fear. The dismissal of at least six ministerial-level officials within a year, a highly unusual occurrence, further illustrates Xi's fear-driven actions. Li Jianping, a Chinese human rights lawyer living in Canada, outlined that China's looming social explosion will stem from two distinct groups. Firstly, there are the grassroots citizens, many of whom are struggling to survive amidst a wave of small business closures caused by the dire economic downturn. The overall shrinkage in social wealth and economic prospects has left numerous small business owners unable to continue, exacerbating the plight of the vulnerable at the bottom. Once their situation becomes unbearable, they may take to the streets in protest. Secondly, there are the elites within the system, including intellectuals and commercial political figures, who still harbor ideals, personal freedoms, dignity, and advocacy. However, under the current oppressive atmosphere, their freedoms have been severely curtailed, leading to concerns about the nation's future. Should the economy further decline and the Communist Party intensify its authoritarian grip, this group may also feel compelled to take a stand. If these two factions unite, the Communist Party's grip on power may become untenable, potentially leading to a recurrence of mass protests akin to the events of June 4, 1989. Government turns mafia, Chengdu police publicly detain Dutch journalist. Recently, Stur Den Daas, a Dutch journalist for NOS stationed in Beijing, covering a rights protection protest in Chengdu, Sichuan, related to the default of Sichuan Trust, was forcibly taken down and detained by undercover officers and police. In detail, Footage captured shows Den Daz being aggressively subdued by plainclothes officers and police, his microphone and backpack confiscated. Officers even used a black umbrella to obscure the filming, before escorting him to a police vehicle where his equipment was confiscated. In a report on the NOS website, Den Daz recounted, as we neared the scene, it was evident officials had intervened. Dragged away from the crowd, a plainclothes officer ordered us to move on. Our cameras and phones were seized, and we spent two hours detained in a local police station. Returning, we were met with vigilant security and undercover police, with staff declining our interviews and protesters nowhere to be seen. On March 1, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China voiced extreme concern. On the same day, Mao Ning, speaking for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, professed unawareness of the details and underscored the need for foreign journalists to adhere to Chinese laws. Stir Den Daz identified Sichuan Trust Bank as offering rates 8% higher than regular banks, labeling it a shadow bank. A Nanjing victim shared with him that it's a legal financial institution with a national license. Their rates are only about 2% higher than traditional banks, not a significant difference. Plus, its shareholders include listed and state-owned enterprises. An industry insider described it as essentially a Ponzi scheme, with funds used not for investment but to cover balance sheet shortfalls. Our money was misused to pay off debts instead of funding projects. It's sheer fraud. Tsai reported on February 27 that Sichuan Trust has faced a payment crisis for nearly four years. Recently, over 8,000 victims agreed to a new trust beneficiary rights transfer contract, regaining some of their principal from a Sichuan state-owned enterprise taking over. 
Stir Den Da's learned through interviews that the acquiring company, Sichuan Tianfu Chenshao Enterprise, was established just two months prior. The signing was coerced, with Chengdu authorities using intimidation tactics, forcing clients to agree to the new terms. Small investors may recoup 80% of their investments, but larger investors will see significantly less, with those investing nearly 4.9 million US dollars receiving only 40% back. In a twist of irony, last November, the CCP announced a one-year, 15-day visa-free policy for citizens from the Netherlands, Germany, France, and other countries. Comments on Den Daza's detention video included warnings against travel to the large North Korea and suggestions for reciprocal treatment of mainland journalists in the Netherlands, preventing them from reporting anything. One said, this is the epitome of lawlessness, and how they find themselves isolated from the world. Netizens ridiculed the actions of the Chinese police, foreign journalists mainly report to an international audience, so their reporting wouldn't impact domestic views on bank rights protection. However, assaulting and detaining journalists only escalates the issue. It seems the CCP is growing more foolish. I must add, none of the CCP's enforcers are innocent. Those oppressing rights advocates and arresting journalists deserve their fate. Wailing Wall Spooks CCP In the wake of China's stock market downturn in February, Chinese citizens flooded the U.S. Embassy in China's Weibo account with messages of frustration and anger, transforming it into a digital wailing wall. Despite the post's accessibility and significant engagement, 185,000 comments, 984,000 likes, and over 20,000 shares, a notable decline in likes and the disappearance of comments related to the A share market sparked backlash among users. On March 1, the U.S. Embassy addressed this issue on Weibo, noting a delay in the visibility of user comments. The embassy stated it does not employ comment filtering and voiced its dissatisfaction with the delay, reaffirming its commitment to fostering open dialogue, debate, and criticism. Voice of America reported insights from Lou Lipping, a former Sino Weibo censor, who indicated that Weibo generally cannot modify content from the U.S. Embassy without direct orders from the Chinese Communist Party. This implies that the CCP, with its keen focus on social media discourse, likely orchestrates censorship efforts through directives from the Cyberspace Administration of China and the Foreign Ministry. Liu also exposed a history of CCP interference with foreign embassy content on social media. Instances include WeChat blocking U.S. embassy posts containing excerpts from President Biden's State of the Union and Secretary of State Blinken's speeches. A 2020 article by the British Embassy on Hong Kong was removed from WeChat within two hours, and the Dutch Embassy in China shut down its WeChat account in 2021 due to censorship frustrations. Furthermore, during the 2018 G20 summit, user interactions with U.S. Embassy WeChat posts about the meeting between then-President Trump and CCP Chairman Xi Jinping were either deleted or hidden, underscoring the extent of CCP's control over online discourse. Let us know your thoughts on today's topic by leaving a comment below. If you found this video helpful, please share it with a friend, it inspires us to continue creating more quality and reliable content. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting insights from China Truths. Thanks for tuning in.